The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome as we gather together to worship Almighty God. Uh, Pastor John, as you noted last week, he announced that he was going to be leaving town for a short vacation with his wife. He embarrassed her, so I won't go into details on that uh, announcement, but uh, I'm glad that you're all here today. Um, this morning we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, and if you are watching from home, uh, we invite you to get your elements prepared for that. Uh, I will say something, well, two things. One, I have four pages of announcements, so I have to go through all of them, which means I'm probably going to have to shorten my sermon. Sorry. Uh, but communion, um, probably many of you growing up celebrate a communion once a quarter, and then it's gone to once a month. Now, I'm one of those advocates that uh, likes to have communion every Sunday, every Lord's Day. And John Calvin, who was the sort of the founder of the Presbyterian tradition, also preferred to have communion celebrated every Lord's Day. But it was too much for the churches in Switzerland, so what he did was he planned his visits to churches on Sundays when they were celebrating communion, so that at least he could celebrate it every week. And the only reason I bring that up is, it's so nice to have so many people up front. <laughs> it's a shame that we have to wait and do this once a month, but I'm so glad to see so many faces. I can see you so well. Uh, also, I, don't, I tend not to like to embarrass people, but I do want to say it's nice to have an addition to the choir today. So, welcome. Uh, this is the first Sunday of the month when we typically take a uh, collection for sharing and caring, and I believe the basket is probably out in the narthex for that. Uh, Kim Moran is continuing to uh, offer a Bible study based on the videos The Chosen uh, that looks at uh, the life of Christ through the eyes of the disciples. And the study will begin at noon today in the fellowship hall and continue on as the dates you will find in your bulletin. I also want to thank all of you who made donations to, uh, for uh, school supplies for Kim and Deb. Uh, they are greatly appreciated, uh, as I know well, because I had to handle 236 children's supply bags this year. And uh, that's my gift. Uh, that's my responsibility of sharing and caring in Niceville. Uh, we had a rummage sale, and Barbara would like to share uh, that news about that, and thank you to all of you who donated items for that. I know it's strange to see me up here, and I'm not asking for anything, but I wanted to thank everybody. It was amazing. We had like 10 people every day. I mean, there were friends and family and people we didn't know that just showed up for the rummage sale. It was, I thank you, thank you, thank you. We could never have done it without you. And we made over $2,200. That's a lot of quarters. So <laughs> thank you. And I overheard a question uh, being asked that when can people start bringing in for next year. Uh, well, I thought I heard you say it's not until the stuff that's in there is taken out. Okay. Okay. So you can start working on that. Uh, tomorrow is Labor Day and want to let you know that the church office will be closed. The Presbyterian Women Luncheon will be, is coming up Tuesday, September 17th. Uh, they're play, playing a fun, dirty Labor Day gift exchange. I don't know what that is, but uh, please, uh, more, more things for the rummage sale, maybe, huh? <laughs> uh, also, on Sunday, September 22nd, there will be a congregational meeting. Uh, not being the pastor here, I don't know why, but uh, there will be one on September 22nd. And also, the annual salad potluck lunch will be Sunday, September 22nd, uh, that same day. Uh, so please bring your favorite salad for that. A couple of other announcements. Um, there is an updated calendar that, for the church calendar, so you can pick that up in the narthex as you leave this morning. 
And also we are sad to hear news that Laura Lee, our office manager, her mother died yesterday. And so please keep her in your prayers as she uh, mourns that loss. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none, uh, let us pray. Righteous God, you lead us by example through your generous love and remind us that there is always more to learn about what it means to live a life of righteousness. Help us to keep our faith nimble, growing with each new neighbor we meet and each experience we live. May we be doers of a word that is deep and wide, letting our lives reflect, reflect the love that we have received. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. And Come, let us adore him. him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, Come, let us adore him. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's grace never changes. Therefore, we come together to confess our sin, trusting that in Christ we have already been forgiven. Let us pray the prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin, followed by a moment of quiet meditation. Merciful God, we confess that our words and actions do not always line up. We are quick to confess our faith, but slow to live it. We sing praise to your name, but we pass by orphans and widows on the other side of the street. Change us, O oh God, 
by your grace, transform us. Root out the selfishness that hardens our hearts and replace it with compassion and generosity. Empower us by your spirit that we might be doers of your word and not hearers only. All this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Christ forgives, Christ transforms, Christ renews. Christ leads us down the path of new beginnings. We are a new creation, ready to sing God's glory and testify to God's grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we see as in a mirror dimly. Your spirit offers clarity, wisdom, and understanding. Open our eyes that these many words of scripture may bear witness to your true word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 15. It can be found on page 495 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles if you would like to follow along. This is a Psalm of David. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not let mon lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter from James. Every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers only who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at that themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If anything that think they are religious 
and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts. Their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All you have to do is look around, and you will notice that we are all different. Tall, short, skinny, well-proportioned. We have black hair, blonde hair, red hair, gray hair, white hair, no hair. We have blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, green eyes. We all like different sports teams. We all came from different cities. We sometimes have an accent that one can tell what part of the country or what country they come from. We are all so very different. How can we manage being together? But there is one thing we all have in common. We have all been here at the font. Maybe not this font, but another font. And maybe it was made out of wood or stone or plastic. Maybe it wasn't even a physical structure, but it was a lake, a river, a swimming pool, a tub. But they all had one thing in common, water. And it was here that we stood and affirmed our faith in Jesus Christ. We were sprinkled, doused, poured over, or immersed. But it was water, and it was here, and we all came to the font. These three questions are asked when one comes to the font. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and can renounce evil and its power in the world? I renounce them. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. A statement of faith. A statement of what you believe. And then the last question. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help. Remember your thanks, your baptism, and give thanks to God. We talk a lot about coming to Jesus and acknowledge him, acknowledging him as Lord and Savior. But after we believe, after we've been to the font, and we leave the font, what are we to do? How are we to become a faithful disciple of Jesus? How do we come obeying his word and showing his love to the world? Well, it doesn't come naturally. Whether you were baptized as an infant or a child or even as an adult, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. We are used to the ways of sin and how easily it is to follow evil and be swayed by its power in the world. But we have promised to obey God's word and show God's love to others. Now, people in the ancient world didn't have personal copies of the Bible. They didn't have self-help books or do-it-yourself videos. Most of their learning was accomplished by watching someone else live their life and model the activity in question, face to face. Or occasionally a letter would be sent from someone who would give instruction on how to live. James wrote this letter to Jewish Christians who were caught up in the social tensions of the mid-first century, where outbreaks of violence, 
and insurrection were taking place in Jerusalem and the, and the surrounding area that culminated in the Jewish revolt in 66 to 70 AD. In fact, the whole Roman world was in revolt and dealing with unrest, with economic problems, food shortages, and a rapid turnover of Roman emperors that led to an erratic government policy against Christians and Jews and others. The problem before the church in this time of uncertainty can be summed up in something like this. How do we remain a faithful Christian community in the midst of this time of trial and temptation? And I would say that's a question that we ask, can ask ourselves today. James wrote to encourage his brothers and sisters and to give them instructions on how to navigate through difficult times. And let me use a word that Pastor John used two weeks ago in his sermon, which I'm sure you all remember. How do we demonstrate faithfulness in the world in which we live as followers of Jesus? Well, first of all, from James, you can tell faithfulness has to be practiced. When you listen to the letter of James, it sounds like a, a random selection of thoughts on Christian living. But this section makes it very clear that no matter what amount of instruction you get, it's useless unless you put it into practice. James wanted the church to become experts, not only in hearing the instruction, but in doing the instruction as well. In verse 2, he writes, Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the word has promised to those who love him. James saw the current situation as a time of testing for the Christian community, but it was also an opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness. And so we, too, live in a time of conflict and struggle. And our faithfulness can be tested and challenged as well. For James, this time of testing was not a result of God throwing down some sort of gauntlet before the church to try to trip us up or to break the church, but rather it was a gift of God, from God, given to his people. A chance to shine in the midst of darkness and a dark world as a community of the new creation that had been brought about by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he points out another thing about the reality, that faithfulness is rooted in the trustworthiness of God. In the Greco-Roman world, people consulted astrology and the stars to make decisions about actions and things that they would do for the future. But James calls the church to remember that they have been given the perfect gift from the Father of lights, the one who himself put the stars in their place. Unlike the changeable nature of events in the present world, there is no variation or shadow due to change in God's nature. God and the word of God are the only reliable sources for the church, which God created in fulfillment of his own purpose. Faithfulness is also grounded in the word. With that word of truth in mind, James goes down to a quick take on how to manage oneself while the world seems to be spinning out of control. It's tempting to give in to anger, to revenge, and nasty words. We hear it all the time. There are plenty of people who use the media to rant and spew venom about some person, some cause or some issue. James would say, however, that it is like trying to deal with a problem without taking the time to read the directions first. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. James instructs his brothers and sisters, to get rid of this kind of reactivity and instead to welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power 
to save your souls. The same word of truth that gives birth also guides words and actions of the one whom God has saved. So, how do we go about activating God's word in one's life? For James, it's very simple. You practice it. This new way of life, as I mentioned, does not come naturally. So be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. The purpose of receiving instruction, receiving the word of truth, is to put that information into practice. If, say, I read a DIY article or watch a YouTube video on how to fix a leaky faucet, but never gather the tools and get down underneath the sink to fix it, what good is it? As soon as I walk away, I'll forget what, I was, what it was about. And I will still have a leaky faucet, a leaky drip. If I really want to fix the problem, I have to grab a wrench, get down on the floor, put my phone with the video on, and get to work. On the other hand, if I just watch the video and say, yeah, I'll get back to that someday, well, I'll quickly forget everything I saw and learn. And James says it's the same thing happens when we only hear the word of God, but don't do it. Don't put it into practice. It's as though we looked into this, or look into a mirror briefly, and then as soon as we walk away, we forget what we saw, what we looked like. Now you have to remember, in the ancient world, not everyone had mirrors. Only the wealthy had mirrors, and they were made out of bronze and not very good. So if one had the opportunity to see themselves, maybe for the first time in their life, and then walk away, it's so easily forgotten. When we fail to take the word that we have received and put it into practice, building a kind of spiritual muscle memory, then we will forget who God created us to be and our calling as people created for God's purpose. Now there's an old Jewish legend that tells of a man who died and went to heaven. Heaven was beautiful, full of lush gardens and glittering mansions. But then the man came to a room lined with shelves, and on, on the shelves were stacked piles of human ears. A heavenly guide explained that these ears belong to people, all, all the people on earth, who listened each week to the word of God, but never acted on God's teachings. Their worship never resulted in action. And when these people died, therefore, only their ears made it to heaven. If we keep our focus on the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere in the midst of trial, being hearers and doers, James tells us we will be blessed in our doing. In fact, it's the doing that matters most to James. Now, faithfulness in following Jesus is hard work. But here's some really great news. Faithfulness is easier when we're in fellowship in a community. Here's an example that men will understand and maybe you women will understand as well. Do you remember when you were learning to tie a tie, a necktie or a bow tie? I can still remember the chart that I had. And when you sit and look at that chart or you have someone standing in front of you tying the tie, it's so hard to do because everything is in the opposite way, like a mirror's reflection. The best way to learn to tie a tie is to have someone stand beside you and you follow along those motions and do it. And helping to build that internal mem muscle memory. It's one thing to conceptualize the process of tying a tie, but you really need someone to demonstrate it for you. And the same is true about true real religion, says James. It's not simply saying the right words and declaring one's faith with some sort of intellectual belief. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God 
is religion that is demonstrated in practice. Practice that becomes second nature as we, as for those who have internalized the word of truth. It's a religion that cares for the most, most vulnerable people like widows and orphans and keeps oneself unstained by the world. It is religion, in other words, that uses the model of Jesus for both its belief and practice. Like tying that tie, there are some things books and videos just can't teach. It can't teach you how to follow Jesus. Oh sure, it can teach you all about the principles of discipleship, but to really learn it, you have to have someone live it out in front of you, guiding you along the way. Information alone won't get it. In Christian faith, it's through imitation as well. And that's why we need each other. We need a community of faith to guide us and give us examples of putting the word into practice. In a culture where there is so much social upheaval, we must see the opportunity to be shining stars that reflect God's glory, rather than to lash out in fear or join the culture's calamity. We shine most brightly when we are doing the word of God in a way that causes other people to see us and want to be instructed in how to do the same. The story is told about a Christian believer who has had been lost at sea and washed up on shore of a remote native village. Half dead from starvation, exposure, and seawater, he was discovered unconscious by the people of the village and was slowly nursed back to full health. He lived thereafter among the people for some 20 years. During this time with them, he lived out his Christian faith. However, he never murmured or sang a hymn or a sacred song. He preached no pietistic sermons. He neither read nor recited scripture in public. He made no personal faith claims whatsoever except by his actions. When people were sick, he visited them, sitting long hours into the night. When people were hungry, he gave them some of his food. When people were lonely, he kept them company. <clears throat> he taught the children. He always took sides with those who had been wronged. There were few, if any, human conditions with which he didn't identify. After 20 years, missionaries came from the sea to the village and began to talk to the people about a man called the Christ. After hearing of this Jesus, the natives insisted that he'd been living among them all for the past 20 years. Come, they demanded, we'll in introduce you to the man about whom you have been speaking. Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, said it well. You really only believe the part of the Bible that you do. So after we believe, what's next? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will, with God's help. Amen. I invite you now to rise as able and let us affirm our faith through the words of the Barman Declaration. <clears throat> As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness, he is also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through him befalls us joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to God's creatures. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification or sanctification through him.
Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. If you have not come to him and would like to share in this new life, we invite you to come and make a declaration of faith. If you'd like more information on how to go about that or to join this congregation, please speak with me at the end of the service and uh, we will connect you with those people who will lead you on that path. And now, Jesus writes, every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Since God is the source of all generosity, let us generously return our tithes and offerings to God. Let us pray. Generous God, we return to you our gifts, not only of our resources, but also of our lives. Sanctify us and use us to work out your purposes in the world. Amen. Come to this table, you who have much faith and you who have very little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time, you who have struggled to follow Jesus and you have who have failed. Come, this is our Lord's table and he offers it to each and every one of us. As this is Lord's table, we remember that the night of his arrest, he took bread, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, and they recognized him. And so, too, now may we see Christ among us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Loving God, you made the world marvelous for us to enjoy. You gave Jesus to be our dear Savior and friend, and so to bring us to you. You sent your spirit to make us one family in Christ. For these gifts of your love, we thank you. For your kindness to us and your goodness to all, we give our thanks. We thank you that you showed your love by sending your son who gave his life for us and rose again from death and lives to pray for us forever. We thank you that for us he was taken away, that taken away all that separates us from you and has made us friends with you and with one another. We thank you that he brought us together to this table to strengthen us by his love. Send your Holy Spirit on us, that these gifts of bread and wine, that we may know Christ's presence, real and true, and be his faithful followers, showing your love to the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Let us offer now to God the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God and then broke the bread, saying, Take, eat. This my body is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, celebrate the feast. Let us pray. Lord, you are our shepherd. There is nothing we lack. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You restore our souls. You lead us in right paths for your name's sake. Even when we walk through the darkest valley, we fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil and our cups overflow. Let your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives and let us live in your house forever. Amen.
People of God, be beautiful, love well, and serve all. Speak gently and listen carefully. Let the mind of Christ be ever guiding you so that your lives may bring glory to God. Go now and do the work of God. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.